Thank you for joining me this beautiful Monday. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our partners and friends around the world. Happy you joined me today. My name is Lori. I am a nurse. I do have a special interest in infection control, and I certainly have seen my share of tasks. Um, we're going to be sitting here for the next hour and just kind of discussing toxic anterior segment syndrome. We're going to talk about the factors that attribute to TAS. We're going to talk a little bit about TAS versus endophthalmitis, give you a good understanding of, of the difference, um, the strategies and the prevention of TAS, and methods for investing in outbreaks, so sort of doing a, a quality insurance study. So from the beginning, TAS, what is TAS? Well, TAS is an acute, it's severe, Intraocular inflammation of the anterior um, in, of the anterior segment after intraocular surgery. Uh, we used to years ago call it sterile endophthalmitis. I'm not sure if that's the best term to be using, but um, it is a sterile postoperative inflammatory reaction. It's non-infectious, um, and the reaction is caused by a non-infectious substance that enters the anterior segment of the eye. So the onset of TAS is very important. So the onset and the involvement of vitreous, this can help differentiate TAS from infectious endophthalmitis. Um, TAS typically starts within 24 hours after surgery. Usually you can see it 24 to 48 hours, um, but it can vary. That can vary from hours to days and can go even further. So you really can't you can't use that as sort of uh, written in stone, but it is gives you a good indication um, how you can differentiate between TAS and anopsomitis. Um, but in cases of TAS related to, let's say, uh, IOL contamination, um, you can see an onset of over a month. So, but typically, TAS involved postoperatively, you're going to see it between 24 to 48 hours after surgery. These are your symptoms. Um, these are usually standard classic symptoms. You could have pain, you can have absence of pain. You could certainly have TAS without any pain at all. Um, marked decrease in vision, uh, you can get photophobia, um, acute severe inflammatory action, as I mentioned, in the AC within you know, 12 to 48 hours after surgery. Typically, you're going to see corneal edema, it's going to go from limbus to limbus. Um, you could see a dilated or an irregular pupil. Your IOP is going to be increased. You're going to get hypothion. You're going to get lack of bacterial or fungal growth. This is really important to note. Your lack of bacterial or fungal growth in cultures of your TAPs. Um, and typically, TAF responds very well to topical steroids and, and drops. So the etiology, how, how do we get TAF? You know, where does TAF come from? There are so very many ways, and I know many of us are used to hearing, and we're going to go into that about contamination of your instruments um, and you know flushing and making sure you're getting all of your debris off your instruments. But there are also other means for you know getting tasks, contaminated BSS, endotoxins that can be in the BSS. And we're going to go into sort of how to do a study to determine if it was a BSS, but that can be a that can certainly be an indication. Any kind of intraocular irrigating solutions that may have an abnormal pH um, as osmolarity or ionic composition, very important, your viscoelastic agents, intraocular medications, and when you're putting antibiotics in the irrigation solution. I know years ago we used to put um, vancomycin in all of our bottles with, the, with epi. Um, uh, I'm not sure if some of you are still doing that practice, but we did stop that practice because of the risk of TAF. Um, but antibiotics and irrigation solution or intercambial um, antibiotics as well. You also have your topical ointments and preservatives. Remember, you have an incision place where you're doing cataract surgery. There is the chance that your topical ointments or any type of medication that has preservatives in it um, can get inside of that wound and can get in the AC. So your topical ointments and your preservatives are important. You know, your metallic um, precipitates, glove powder. You know, when you're touching the tips of instruments or your IOLs, if your scrubs, you know, as they're uh, loading that IOL for you, are they using gloves with powder in them? Um, are they holding the IOL and then, you know, trying to load it that way? Are they somehow getting the tips of those instruments that are going to go into the AC and you possibly could get gloves, um, that glove powder onto your instruments? Water quality is a big one. 
Uh, I know um, it can be difficult in some areas with your water quality, but water quality is, is, a, is a very big topic um, when it comes to cleaning instruments, when it comes to rinsing instruments, you want to be sure of the right water quality. And we're going to get into that as well. Ultrasonic baths, we're going to talk about um, reuse of single use devices. There are devices that are not meant to be re-sterilized. Um, this is very important. And then, you know, of course, you break down in the standard sterilization practices. Inadequate sterilization of surgical instruments and tubing. I think this is what most of us are uh, you know, used to seeing is when it comes to tests. Inadequate flushing of instruments between cases resulting in that buildup of viscoelastic. Um, irritants on the surface of ophthalmic instruments that can accumulate from inadequate or inappropriate instrument cleaning. So the inappropriate use or incomplete rinsing of detergent absolutely has been associated with TAFs. And that's what we're gonna discuss mostly today because I think this is where many of us um, have seen our cases of TAFs. All right, so let's start with your autoclave. I know many of you have tabletop autoclaves. All right. Bacteria biofilm, that's a contamination in the autoclave reservoir. So if your autoclaves um, work by, you have your reservoir um, and you're filling that reservoir with water, okay? Those reservoirs can produce heat stable bacterial toxins that can contaminate your instruments during the autoclave process. So let's talk a little bit about this. How are you cleaning your reservoirs? I, oh my goodness, I remember many years ago, we had tabletop sterilizers that we used to use for minor procedures. Um, we could also use them in the OR as well. And they weren't very easy to um, clean. And you have your little tubing and we'd, you know, unlock the, the lock on it and the water would flow out. But you always have that, that film on the bottom of that reservoir. How are you cleaning that? You, you, we couldn't get our anything in there to clean it. And I can remember people attempting to, you know, literally tip these things upside down to try to rinse out and clean these sterilizers. It was very difficult. Um, so how are you cleaning your reservoirs? Is it easily accessible and cleanable? Can you get in there? Can you clean them? Are you just let go into the flow of water to flow out? And that's it. Are you cleaning them once a day? Are you cleaning them after, you know, uh, at the end of every day? Are you starting off each day with a um, empty reservoir, start fresh with new water? Or are you using the same water from yesterday? And then the water quality, what are you using? All right, we're gonna talk about the IFUs. Instructions for use, manufacturer's instructions. What does a manufacturer say you have to use in your reservoirs for that sterilizer? All right, is it, uh, we call it critical water, is it treated, is it sterile water, is it, um, you know, what, typically it's not tap water, but what is the water quality that you're putting in there, what is it saying that you need to use for that reservoir, but more importantly, how does it tell you to clean it, what does it tell you to use, is it asking you to use, uh, you know, alcohol, okay, some, I have seen some that tell you to rinse with alcohol, but then after you do that, you've got to be sure that you are running loads and rinsing and rinsing and rinsing and getting rid of whatever um, cleaner it's telling you to use. So these are all important things. You need to follow your IFUs, your manufacturer's instructions, and be using what it's telling you to use, but being sure that you're thorough. Okay, really take a good look at how you're cleaning your reservoirs. Is it easily cleanable? All right, and if it's not, you really take a good look at your sterilization practices and what you could be using um, to assure that whatever you're using to sterilize your equipment is easily cleanable. Your ultrasonic machines, this is a big one. Just like your sterilizers, heat stable under toxins from this overgrowth of gram negative bacilli in the water of ultrasonic cleaners. Okay, this is another cause of TAS. All right. How are you emptying the water chamber? in your sonic machine. This is one example, I just threw this in here, but I mean, you could have small ones, little ones, large ones. Either way, they have to be emptied out. Same thing, most of them have a, a tubing that you let go of and the water just flows out. Okay, you're still left with that, that film of water on the bottom. How are you rinsing that out? How often are you rinsing that out? So not only how are you emptying it, how are you cleaning it? Are you doing it in between patients? Are you doing it once a day? What does your IFU tell you? 
most of them tell you you should be doing it after every use. You're cleaning it completely, you're disinfecting it, um, washing it down, and then you're starting fresh again. I know some facilities do that once a day. You need to look at your IFUs and you need to decide policies and procedures. You need to have a protocol. You have it written right there in front, you know, on the wall or somewhere in the sterile processing area. This is how we clean our sonic machines. But most importantly, make sure everyone is doing it the same way. Consistency. No deviation in your protocol. Everyone should be doing it the exact same way. And this is one of the things that we'll discuss when we talk about quality assurance studies, because typically when you see tests, and you're going to see somewhere along the line, somebody deviated from protocol. They thought, you know, oh, I think it cleans better this way. I think if I do it this way, you are going to have a much better result. And now you've deviated away from protocol. And this is often how you can see tests come about. So really take a good look at your procedures for cleaning your um your sonic machines and making sure that you're emptying that water chamber as well as you can. Make sure you follow your IFUs, make sure you have a good protocol for cleaning it, how often you're cleaning it, and that every person is trained correctly on it and that you have you know, consistency. Everybody's doing it the same way. Viscoelastic. Okay, these are your ophthalmic viscosurgical devices, your OVDs. So contamination or denaturation, denaturation, so really what that is, is that the process of modifying the molecular structure of a protein. All right, so basically what denaturation means is it involves the breaking of many of the bonds within a protein, um, within that protein molecule, and which is responsible for the structure of the protein in its natural state. So basically it means you're taking away its natural quality. So contamination um, you know, of the viscoelastic can certainly be a potential cause of TAS. Often it can cause clusters of cases. Um, and when it does, this is where you're gonna look at your specific batches, okay? This is where you're gonna go back and look at your lot numbers and see if there is a correlation. You know, oh, you know, I have three, four or five cases of TAS and they all have the same lot number of viscoelastic. All right, so this is a, a, a good chance to go back and see. And if it does, this is where you know you got to get rid of those lots. Um, again, quality assurance study. But typically, when you have contaminated viscoelastic or even contaminated BSF, same thing. You're usually going to see those clusters of cases. Um, they usually involve a specific batch or a specific lot number. Um, you can also get contamination by an endotoxin during the manufacturing um, from bacterial fermentation. Um, traces of viscoelastic residue can attach to surgical instruments. This is that, that biofilm on the instruments. And they may not get completely removed during cleaning. All right, you didn't do, you didn't do thorough cleaning. Um, and that's when you start to be, you know, take away from the viscoelastic natural quality and it, you know, it can become toxic. Um, so some of the ways that viscoelastic can certainly cause tasks. One, it's contaminated, the viscoelastic itself is contaminated, or the viscoelastic is, is sitting there on the instrument, sitting inside of the instrument. You're talking about cannulas, and it's not thoroughly clean, and it stays on there, and then it's brought into the next patient, and these instruments are used on the next patient. So these are the, some of the uh, ways you can certainly cause tasks in viscoelastic. And then, of course, flushing of instruments. I know this is a hot topic, but I think we all know that inadequate flushing between cases can certainly um, result in that buildup of viscoelastic. So let's go back to the basics of decontamination. Decontamination starts immediately at your back table, your scrub nurses, your assistants. Be sure that after you're using um, that instrument or that cannula, that you already begin cleaning it right then and there, right on that back table. Don't let things sit there and, um, and dry on your back table. Okay, you want to be sure that you're cleaning things as thoroughly as you can, but right away. When you're done with the procedure, are those instruments going to sit there for a little while before somebody in thorough processing can get to them? Well, they do make sprays that you can spray instruments with that will keep them moist until you can get to the decontamination process in your sterile um, processing department. So keep those instruments moist, clean them as soon as you can. Flushing of all lumens. These are your small bore instruments, your cannulas, um, even your phaco needles. If your phaco needles are getting reprocessed, if your IFUs, 
and your manufacturer's instructions say that you can reprocess your FACO needles. Typically they have it will say, you know, you can reprocess it five times or 10 times. Um, be sure you're flushing these things very well and according to manufacturer's instructions. Copious amounts of fluid. Um, if you're using a machine, typically they um, spit out about 120 cc's of fluid followed by air. If you're using a syringe, that's fine. Just be sure that you're flushing good amounts of fluid through those cannulas, and then you're following it up with air. Really important, because if you're flushing, flushing, flushing with a fluid, let's say it's sterile water, um, you wanna be sure that that sterile water is not gonna sit in there during the sterilization process, and that it's gonna be in that cannula for the next patient, for that surgeon to push out right into the next patient's eye. So air is a very, very good point to make. No matter what you're doing when you're flushing, be sure that you're following it with air. Um, some people um, have machines um, and they have compressed air. That's great if you have it. If you don't, it's perfectly fine. You can use a syringe, uh, an air syringe. Just fill it up with air and push it until you see no more fluid come out. Um, make sure that your final rinse is treated water and is not tap water that can have all kinds of contaminants in it. All right, treated water, distilled water, sterile water. This is your treated water. Um, you always want to make sure that that last rinse, okay, is is your is your treated water. Um, if you can use disposable cannulas, that's always preferred. But I can I know a lot of people put a lot of um, a lot into using disposable instruments, and if you can do it, that's wonderful. But if your practice is a thorough and you've got good quality protocols good quality procedures, you're taking your time in between cases, you're doing things correctly, this isn't a race. Um, you know, you can use cannulas that are, you know, reusable. Uh, we've been using reusable cannulas uh, for 20, 30 years, to be honest with you. But this is with, you know, proper protocols in place, taking the time to do it right. So yes, disposable cannulas are certainly preferred. Um, it takes the, the worry out of it. But remember, if budget doesn't allow for disposable cannulas, you can use reusable ones and still and still be fine if you're using the right protocol and the the right methods and take your time. That's what's most important is to take your time. Again, this isn't a race. Um, every person deserves clean, sterile um, instruments. Um, so be sure that when you're working with your surgeon, you're handing them a cannula. You want to make sure that you're flushing the cannula out before you give it to them. In other words, flush those cannulas with BSF. Just in case, just in case you have some um, fluid that may still be in there, some water that may still be in there from the cleaning process. So before you're handing that surgeon that um, cannula, you want to make sure that you're flushing it really well with BSF. Surgeons out there, you can do the same before you enter the AC. Just give it a good flush, okay? Make sure that it's patent as well, but make sure that you're getting um, you're getting any solution that may still be in there out. These are wonderful um, machines to use if you can if you can get them. These um, this particular one um, comes with a, a base and it's used to flush instruments, and it also has air that flushes through. They're wonderful, but please remember that. These can also harbor microorganisms. These also can be a um, a result of TAF. If these these little tubings and all those little spots and you know that you can get um, you can get biofilm in these, these actually get autoclave. The bottle can get autoclave. The cap, the tubing sets, that is all autoclavable. Okay, make sure you're following your IFUs um, and understand that there is a process for cleaning these because these can be a potential cause of TAF. With all these, you know, all these tubings um, that you see here, all these joints and all these places that, you know, can harbor material in them, you want to be sure you're cleaning these out. Um, you have protocols in place in your facility for how often. I see most, most facilities do it at the end of the day. They throw all this, they clean it out well, and they throw it all into the sterilizer. Um, but just please understand that these tubings and some of the materials in this particular machine can be a cause of test, and that's something that you can certainly look at if you're doing a study and you're trying to go back and try to figure out, oh my goodness, you know, where, where did, you know, where did test come from? This is a thought, okay? And just make sure that you're cleaning this, you're following your IFUs. Um, again, you can throw these typically into a sterilizer if you have sterilizers that can fit it. 
Um, just make sure that you're cleaning them and make sure that you do have in the back of your head that this could be a possible you know, cause for tests. Thorough rinsing, not only of your cannulas, of course, but you're doing decontamination of your instruments. Okay, all your instruments on your back table get decontaminated, regardless of whether they were used or not. If that instrument gets put on your back table, that instrument gets cleaned. Everything, everything gets cleaned and put in. Okay. Um, thorough rinsing to remove that detergent, however you're doing it, whether it you have a wonderful big machine that does, um, you know, cleaning. Uh, rinsing, drying everything together, or you're just doing it in a sink. Either way, make sure you have the right protocols in place for rinsing these instruments. Rinse, 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 get that detergent off of there. But not just your instruments, also your instrument trays as well. Everything has an IFU and it's going to tell you how to clean things. So look and see what it's telling you and how to clean these trays, all right? Because as well, these can be, um, you know, contaminated. Look at those maps. You get those little, uh, I have a friend who calls them little fingers. Those, those maps, those maps are very important. Okay, those maps can get kind of icky in there. Um, you wanna make sure that you're cleaning them well. So you're pulling out those maps. You're cleaning those maps um, according to the IFUs, that instrument tray. You're cleaning these instrument trays according to the IFU, however it's telling you to do it. Okay, so just make sure that these instrument trays are not used over and over and over and over again, or you're taking instruments out of them, putting them back in them and they're never getting cleaned. I, I have seen some facilities do that as well. They take the instruments out, they, you know, they put them in, um, these trays never get cleaned properly. So make sure those mats come out, they're clean, especially the under, underneath them, okay? Um, and these trays get as much love and attention as your, you know, as your cannulas do and as your instruments do. Intracameral injections. All right, this has been, this was a hot topic for quite some time and it still, it still can be. Um, corneal endothelial toxicity and TAS, they can be potential concerns with intracameral injections. Certainly not telling you not to use them. Okay, that is a surgeon's discretion. Um, just wanted to give you an understanding of how it can be a, possibly a cause of TAS. Um, the drug component itself, preservatives, all right, any preservatives, if you're not using preservative free intracameral injections, okay, please be aware, preservatives certainly it can be a cause of TAS. Abnormal pH in the drug. Pot, it can be possible as well that small amounts of, let's say, a subconscious injection, let's say you're doing genomycin, um, that can access the AC through a surgical incision after injection. All right, so intracameral injections, there's different ways, um, subconscious injections as well. So just, you know, keep that in the back of your head. Um, you know, if you're getting TAS, something to look at. Uh, I know years ago, we used to do subconscious injections on everyone. Some people still use them, some don't. Um, I, honestly, I see an array of different methods when it, uh, different, uh, yeah, different methods of intracameral injections um, in the sense of, I shouldn't say methods, but you know, different, uh, some people use them, some people don't, put it that way. Um, I can't say that all of a sudden nobody, everybody stopped using them. I still see surgeons all the time using them. They have no problems, beautiful. I see some that have stopped. Um, for that, you know, for that reason of TAS. So surgeon's discretion, okay. Um, depends on, you know, just keep in the back of your head, corneal endothelial toxicity, okay. And TAS with intercameral injections. All right, so summary on TAS, make sure, again, not a raise. <clears throat> Adequate time taken for thorough cleaning and sterilization. Adhere to protocols. Make sure everyone's doing it the same way. Everyone does it according to your policies and procedures. Okay, you don't deviate from that. You have a sufficient inventory of instruments that meet surgical volume. Okay, this is giving you enough time for thorough processing. All right, it's going to be hard to keep up with surgical volume if you've only got, you know, a minimal amount of trays. You get to process the trays as fast as you can. So make sure that you have sufficient inventory to process them correctly. Make sure you're following your IFUs. Don't allow viscoelastic solutions to dry out instruments. Make sure you're, you're doing decontamination at your back table as soon as possible. Using it, um, decontamination at point of use. When possible, to use disposable supplies. Do not reuse supplies that are labeled for single use only. Often these supplies are written that way because they shouldn't be sterilized, okay? They can't be, they can't be usually steam sterilized. Um, they're not supposed to be reused. 
for a reason to make sure that you know you're not reusing supplies that stay single use only. Clean ophthalmic instruments separately from non ophthalmics for any of your centers out there that are a um, a multi surgery center where you're doing other procedures besides ophthalmic procedures if you're doing ortho you're doing GI and you're doing ophthalmology make sure that you're you're giving love to these ophthalmic instruments okay that you're cleaning them separately from other instruments, from all that debris that could possibly be, um, you know, from um, other large, um, more complex, more detailed surgeries. Um, make sure that you're cleaning them separately, okay? That you're not doing your eye instruments and your, your ortho instruments, you know, in the same sonic machine, all right? Make sure you're thoroughly rinsing these instruments with a copious amount of water, remove all that detergent, that water quality, that last rinse really should be with critical or treated water and make sure those ultrasonic cleaners are emptied, they're clean, they're disinfected, they're rinsed out of that disinfected and dried, at least daily, preferably after each use. I understand that <laughs> that might be a big task um, for many of us, but just be sure that you're following the IFUs and that you have the protocols in place and that you're all doing it the same way. Treatment for tasks, most cases are very successfully treated with topical steroids. You got your mild and early cases. Um, you know, you could have a, a four to eight times a day of a steroid, sometimes it's a 1% prednisone or 0.1 of dexamethasone are usually standards. Moderate cases, it can take three to six weeks to clear up. Now, if you've got a severe case, you've got some dense fibrin, hypopian, you're going to usually use oral prednisone. Okay. Um, surgery is an option as well. If the inflammation persists, you may want to do an AC washout. Um, vitrectomy, you may need to remove that eye well. All right, these are all at the surgeon's discretion, of course. But most most cases, again, are successfully treated with topical steroids. Typically, we see prednisone or uh, or dex. So now we get into endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis, severe inflammatory condition resulting from an infection of the intraocular cavities. This is your aqueous and your vitreous. It can be acute. It can be chronic. It can develop very rapidly or it could develop slowly, and it could persist for a long period of time. It could be any of these. Okay? There are two types of anoxomitis. Um, you have the endogenous, which is, which is rare, um, and this from endo outside the body. This can sometimes happen with immunocompromised individuals. Hematogenous spread, bacterial or fungal, but usually with anoxomitis, more commonly is the exogenous, all right? This occurs from outside the eye. This is your contamination from something that entered the eye. Um, this is the most common type. It can occur after surgery. Um, it can occur after penetrating ocular trauma. Um, it can be an extension of a corneal infection. Um, it can happen after intravitual injections of uh, VEGF. Um, but we're gonna fo focus mostly on the exogenous, okay? What you're typically gonna see after surgery. So symptoms of anophthalmitis, poor visual acuity, you're going to get that corneal edema, the hypopian, the vitreous inflammation, poor fundus visualization, reduced vision. Post-op anophthalmitis, typically these, these patients are in pain. Okay, it is painful. You could get swollen red eyelids. Um, you can get some photophobia, inocular discharge as well. So you can see some of these symptoms compared to, uh, compared to TAF. Etiology, it's an infectious agent. Somehow that infectious, infectious agent got inside the eye. Bacterial, most common, gram-positive bacterial. It can also be fungal. It can be gram-negative as well, but more commonly we see gram-positive. Um, it can also be a fungal. Treatment, intravitreal injection. It, you can get a high concentration of the drug in the vitreous cavity without the systemic side effects. So you can go with vancomycin, um, ceftazidine, you can also go with amicacin. Uh, I don't see amicacin used as often anymore um, because of the macular, the risk of macular ischemia doesn't mean it's not used anymore, but I, I don't see it as often. It seems to be the, the two drugs of choice seem to be vancomycin and ceftazidine. Okay. Just if you're mixing your own, please, please be sure you're using obviously the proper dose and aseptic technique. Both these things are critical. If you don't have the right dose, an inadequate dose can cause a treatment failure. If you have an excess dose, it can cause toxic effects on the retina. 
Um, and of course, if you're mixing your own drugs, you have the potential for poor technique, and that's certainly not going to help. You already have an infectious eye. You certainly don't want to add to that. Okay, so if you're mixing these drugs, please be sure that you're following good, proper aseptic technique, okay, and that your dosing is correct. This is a great graph. I did that get this um, from the internet. Um, this is going to really kind of really go through here for you. Um, just kind of the side-by-side -side endophthalmitis and tests. Let's take a look at this here. So with endophthalmitis, okay, 75% of patients typically get pain. All right, pain is certainly something you see in endophthalmitis, but with TAS, minimal, you know, minimal pain, if any, at all, okay? Um, with endophthalmitis, you can, does it, occur, does it occur in clusters? It can be sporadic. You can get cases of sporadic endophthalmitis, but typically TAS, you're going to see some outbreaks. You know, you're going to see those clusters. Visual acuity, severe reduction with endophthalmitis. Um, with TAS, it can go anywhere from mild to severe. All right, you have quite that range. Elevated IOP. It's typically common with anophthalmitis. Um, it's not common. You can get uh, elevated IOP for sure, um, but it's not as common with TAS. Corneal reaction, typically it's not limbus to limbus um, edema, but you are going to see limbus to limbus corneal edema with TAS. Your AC reaction. So here's your difference between the two. You, you're going to see mostly three plus cells in your endophthalmitis, whereas cells for TAS, one to three. Fibrin, it varies. Um, and then ophthalmitis and TAS, you might see a one to three plus. Um, hypopian, is, you're going to see typically a three plus um, in ophthalmitis. It's, it's, uh, it's terrible to see, usually. Um, but in TAS, you're going to get one plus. Pupil, round and reactive with an ophthalmitis, whereas with TAS, um, you might get uh, midriatic, um, dyscoric. Um, it can usually happen in later stages, um, but you, you, you are going to see, um, you may see pupil reaction um, in TAS. Your vitreous reaction, vitreous, it, you're going to see that, of course, in your ophthalmitis. You've got an infectious of the vitreous cavity. Um, in TAS, it's usually clear you can have some spillover, um, and vitreous is, is rare. You're going to see that obviously mostly with your endophthalmitis. Steroid response. So in the ophthalmitis, it, it can worsen it, whereas in TAS, it will improve. So this is sometimes an indication how you know between the two because TAS typically has a very good response to um, steroids. Your antibiotic response, um, same thing. Let's, let's opposite. It's, it will improve your endophthalmitis, whereas in TAS, it could worsen it. Or you may not see any response. So your prognosis for endophthalmitis, it, it, it can generally be poor. It depends on how fast you can, um, you can treat it. Again, you're seeing typically um, three to seven days after surgery for endophthalmitis, one to three days after surgery for TAS. So as fast as you can catch it and you can treat it, um, depends on its symptoms and, and depends on how hard it has affected the eye, depends on, of course, your prognosis. Um, with TAS, it's, pretty, it's, it's typically good with your steroids. You typically get a good response. Whereas an ophthalmitis, it can be tough. Now, something to remember as well three to seven days after surgery with an ophthalmitis. And, and you can often see this even further out. Um, you also got to look at your patients and how well they're caring for themselves. And I say this because I've seen this in the past where we have had to cancel patients because they've come in and we have noticed um, very sadly with poor hygiene um, or they, they may not, they may live alone. They've got no one to help them. Of course, um, they are a potential risk for endophthalmitis. Um, they, they have a, risk of introducing infection into their eye. And it's something to note when you're doing your clinical evals or even in pre-op when you have a patient that presents and you do see an unfortunate circumstance where these patients, you, you just know that they are a high risk for infection. Really, really good patient education is what you need in these cases. Patients can come in very poor hygiene, their hands, their nails, their, um, you know, their clothes, you can tell that you know, these are unfortunate situations where they're not caring well for themselves or they don't have the ability to care for themselves. You've got to remember that you know, these patients are going to be caring for their eye. They're going to be adding drops to their eye. They're going to be cleaning their eyes after surgery. And they can certainly be um, a risk for a potential for an infection. So this is where good patient education comes along.
Okay. Um, we have canceled patients for this and we have offered, you know, we've offered social work, we've offered, you know, if these are options, um, you know, any type of uh, medical care at home where maybe you can set up some type of care afterwards for these patients for someone to come in and help them with cleaning and help them with their drops. But it's just something to think about. It's not always something that's related to surgery. This could also be um, related to you know, your patient and how well they can care for themselves. So this is a great graph. This is you know something to just kind of look at and see your difference. For those of us, I did get the questions, how can you tell between TAS and endophthalmitis? Here you go. This is you know something I actually um, got online and it really is a great graph to just see side by side. All right, so now you have a case or you have cases of TAS. Now what do you do? Okay, let's talk about, you know, an outbreak. All of a sudden you have three, four, five cases that come in post-op day one and they all have TAS. So where do you start? Okay. Um, the first thing, of course, you need to do is you're going to determine the cause. So you can stop this. So you're not, you know, looking at, you know, the next day. And there are, there, there is the possibility that if you've got that big of clusters of TAF and that many patients, you may need to close your OR until you find out what the cause of this TAF is. You certainly don't want to continue on doing patient care if you don't know what's causing it. Um, you know, one or two cases is one thing, but when you're getting, you know, six, seven, 10 cases of TAF within, you know, within a day, obviously something is wrong and you really have to look um, and go back. And this is where you're going to do a quality improvement study. Your goal is to find the common denominator. Okay. You're going to find that one thing that every case has, and this is where you're going to um, hopefully find the cause. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about a, a good quality assurance study and how you can go back and, and see if you can find the cause. So What's very important about doing this is that you gather your data one data at a time. If you do more than one, you're not going to be able to narrow it down. In other words, if you see, oh my goodness, you know, I see this, this, but I also see this. You've got to do it one data at a time. This is how you're going to be able to, um, you know, bring it down to the level where you can see that one thing that all your patients have. So don't go and do multiple things to see if you can figure it out. Start one thing at a time, okay? Pull your patients, look at your schedule, figure out every patient, every patient you have, make a graph, every patient that developed TAF. Now look and see what's a surgical day. You could have them over two days. If you could get an outbreak of four or five, and then, then day two, um, you know, a different surgeon, three or four, all right? So pull the surgical days. All your patients, what days they had surgery on. What surgeons, is it one particular surgeon? multiple surgeons, okay, um, start, start there. I'm going to start your chart. Now let's start with the operating room. Okay, if you have more than one OR, you have one, okay, that, that helped that. If you have more than one OR, let's look and see which OR they were in. Sometimes, you know, your study could even stop there. Oh my goodness, you know, 10 patients got tasked and all 10 were in OR1. All right, something's going on in OR1. Um, but now you want to look at your graph, patient, surgical day, surgeon, operating room, work your way down. Now you go to your staff, your scrubs and your circulators. How are your circulators prepping? Okay, it's not always, you know, it doesn't, may not always happen um, at your back table. How are your circulators prepping the eye? You could stop there. Now you've identified, same scrub. Move on. Instrument sets. Now let's look at your sterilizers. Do you have more than one? If you do, you should be able to go back to all of your instruments and be able to see which sterilizers they were sterilized in. Okay, you got to be able to track it somehow, some way, whatever your process is, whatever your protocol that you have in your facility, you need the ability to go back and track which instruments came from which sterilizer. Typically, it's put in the patient's chart and somehow in the patient's record, or you could have a log book. You could have a schedule sitting by the sterilizer. And every one, every, you know, every instrument tray that came out, it's going into room one. John Doe is in room one. Room one, the instrument tray um, came out of sterilizer A, sterilizer B. Or you could put it into the patient's chart themselves. Okay. Either way, you should be able to identify every patient and which sterilizer these instruments came out of, however your facility does them. Now let's look at your instrument cleaning procedures. First of all, has anything changed? Are you using a new detergent? 
Are you using any new solutions? Um, have you changed, you know, water quality? Have you changed from distilled to something else? Has anything changed in how you're cleaning your instruments? Okay, that's often, often this is where we may see tasks is when we start changing protocols. It's okay to change. We all we always want to be, um, we always want to be up on our game. And we always want to be using the best things for our patient care, best quality. It's okay to change, but just keep that change in mind. Always know, okay, I'm changing to this. Because if you're going to get tasks or even an infection, something, sometimes you can go back and say, oh, my goodness, you know, we just changed to this type of BSS from this company instead of this company. Uh, oh, okay, you know, we've changed this detergent. We're using this instead of this. And when you start introducing multiple changes, this is where you may have problems. So let's look at your East instrument cleaning product. Okay, see if anything has changed. Now let's talk to your store processing staff. Are they all doing it the same way? Are they all following the same protocol? Does anyone deviating from it? We're not out to shame anyone. We're not out to pull anyone out. We're out to learn. We're out to learn, um, learn from each other, you know, education. Because this is where you're going to find that, yep, you have that one person um, that is, you know, doing things separately than everyone else. And I'm going to give you a good example of that. Um, years ago, I did see a um, an outbreak, a uh, cluster, so to speak, of TAF. Uh, quite a few patients. I don't remember how many in one day. But they were all in one day. They were all with, um, they weren't all with one surgeon. Um, they were with multiple surgeons. So we started the graph. We started with, you know, which patients received them. This, uh, which patients, you know, develop tasks. We looked at the surgical days and there were different days, multiple days. We looked at the surgeons, multiple surgeons. All right, we haven't quite, you know, we haven't quite factored in anything yet. Looking for that common denominator. Looking at the operating room. Nope, they are all different operating rooms. Okay. Looking at your staff, bingo. They were all the same scrub. So different patients, different surgery days, different surgeons, different ORs but they were all the same scrub. So there was that common denominator. Okay, so let's, let's think now, same scrub. Uh, you know, do we have a, a, a sterile technique issue? Well, I know the scrub, I've scrubbed with her, I've worked with her for years, I know she's an excellent scrub. Um, she's got excellent technique. Of course, you never know, could certainly, something could be wrong. Didn't really think that was it, but there's our common denominator. So after sitting down and interviewing the scrub, we learned something. One of the blades that was used they were reprocessed, um, they were uh, approved to be reprocessed, but this particular scrub was cleaning this blade different than anybody else on the back table, I think, dipping it into the BSS or, you know, they wasn't cleaning it the same way as everyone else. And lo and behold, this biofilm was gathering on this blade and sitting there and was not getting sterilized very well. And she just changed to this technique you know, recently thought, oh, this, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it this way. I think this is a good way. You know, it, it was certainly an innocent enough act. But after doing the study, we realized there's our common denominator, there's our one scrub, and she was cleaning things differently than everyone else against protocol against the IFU. Innocently enough, she thought it was a nice way to do it. She thought it gave it a, a good final rinse. But unfortunately, that final rinse caused this biofilm to sit on the blade. And now that blade is going into a clear corneal incision. And there you go, there's your introduction into the AC. So this is how a, a QI study, you know, this is how you can find that common denominator. Um, after you've done your study, let's hope you found that common denominator. Don't just stop there. This is where you need to interview your staff. This is where you need to get everyone together. Again, not to shame everyone, and you certainly don't have to call anyone out, but this is to explain the process of cleaning instruments. and explain to everyone, you know, what, what changing protocol can do. Um, by this time, everyone's gonna know that you have a task outbreak. Um, you can certainly do your quality assurance study as a team. You can assign team members to, you know, again, you don't wanna go, you wanna do one thing at a time, all right? But you can certainly do this as a team approach. But in the end, you wanna make sure you have good staff communication Explain the process for cleaning instruments from the back table all the way until your sterilization area. Um, this is where you're gonna sit everybody down and you're just gonna talk through it. And th this includes your surgeons as well. Your surgeons really do, how many, how many 
surgeons know your process for sterilizing instruments. They know and understand the right process. They, you know, they should understand the process as well and know that you're doing everything that you can do to be sure that you're giving the best quality care to your patients, okay? Involve them as well. But in the end, your quality assurance studies, you're gonna look for that common denominator, all right? Start from the beginning, one at a time. Make a graph, patient, surgical bays, surgeon, operating room, staff, look at all your staff, scrub and circulator. Make sure you're following your instrument sets from the sterilizer to the patient that you can go back. You should be able to go back and look and see patient A got had instruments that came from sterilizer A. Look at your instrument cleaning products. Has anything changed? Is anything new? Look at the protocol. Has anyone changed anything? Talk to your sterile processing staff. Make sure we're all following the same thing and make sure that you interview your staff and you explain the process for cleaning instruments and that you're following the same protocol. Staff education, just as I mentioned, all team members. Okay, this isn't just your scrub. If you find that it was the <clears throat> scrub or it was the circulator, you're not just gonna pull them out and call them out and call the day. You're gonna get together and it includes all team members. Again, you're not there to shame anyone, you're just there for, for staff education to learn from each other. Emphasize the importance of task prevention. Staff awareness. When you have new staff and you're bringing new staff in, especially those that may not be familiar with ophthalmology, do they know what TAS is? I mean, if you're out in the outside world and you're coming from med surge, you're coming from a different world of, let's say, nursing, um, do they understand and know what TAS is? This is where they really need to be sat down and go through some type of continuing education on what TAS is, what end is, and how to prevent it. Hold regular training sessions yearly, quarterly, however you like to do it. Just make sure that you're holding training sessions that people keep in mind and always have that constant education on tasks and make sure that everyone understands the guidelines on appropriate cleaning and sterilization of your equipment. Okay. Consistency. Determine the protocol and make sure that everyone is following it. Okay. Um, the staff education is very important. Quality insurance is very important. Do your studies, sit down, do one at a time. Don't do a whole cluster of, you know, implementing things all at once. Um, and in the end, you'll probably find your common denominator. And that's it. That is my talk on TAS. <clears throat> I think we may have a few questions. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. Um, can I share? Yeah, just a few. Can I share my slides? And I'm happy to share slides with anyone. Um, if you have any questions on the bottom of the screen, you're going to see um, cybersite.org. All right, please feel free to log in. Um, <clears throat> And uh, ask any questions through Cyber Site. I'm always, always happy and always available to answer any questions for you. Um, and certainly could, you know, certainly could share my slides if you'd like me to. Um, systemic disease drugs, high risk of causing TAS. Again, for me, um, it's all about your intercambial injections. Um, those are drugs I was focusing mostly on. Um, you know, your intercambial injections have certainly had a background in, um, you know, in TAS. Um, but, you know, focus mostly on those. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, my talk mostly consisted of all ophthalmic um, when it comes to medications. But um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I appreciate all the wonderful comments that are coming through. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Okay, sidesite.org. And I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Have a wonderful day and enjoy this beautiful Monday. Thank you.